In 2005, in a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation poll to determine the greatest Canadian who ever lived, David Suzuki was ranked fifth by his fellow citizens, which made him the greatest living Canadian. He is consistently ranked as Canada's most trusted, most admired, and most inspiring leader. And no wonder. As scientist, author, broadcaster, and teacher, David Suzuki has been interpreting and defending nature to viewers and audiences in Canada and the world for more than 40 years. He has written 52 books, and his television show, The Nature of Things, is seen in more than 40 countries. In 1990, he co-founded, with his wife Tara Cullis, the David Suzuki Foundation, dedicated to finding ways for society to live in balance with the natural world that does sustain us. The Foundation is now one of Canada's most influential environmental organizations. But when I sat down to talk with this legendary environmental champion, I found myself engaged in a quite moving and quite personal conversation. Your original title for your autobiography was The Outsider, yeah. which at this from this perspective, seems like a surprising title, but why was that? Well, my, my family objected violently to the idea of outsider, but it's something that certainly psychologically I've always felt uh, an outsider. Now, their argument was that's not how the public sees you, and they'd be offended to think that that's what, how you see yourself. Um, but, you know, I grew up as a, a, a young boy in Vancouver, unaware that I was racially different from the other kids around until December 7th, 1941. And to me, that was the definitive moment when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Suddenly, my parents, who were born and raised in Canada, were declared enemy aliens, basically, deprived of all rights of citizenship. We lost everything and were shipped off into the interior. Now, the irony is that in the camps, as a child, I, I experienced directly racism or prejudice from the other Japanese kids. My mom and dad were born in Canada. They spoke English at home. Most of the kids in the camp were the children of parents who had come from Japan. So they were fluently bilingual. And I couldn't speak a word of Japanese. And so in the camps, they would, use, they would flip between Japanese and English all the time. And I was an outsider there. And they used to pick on me. I mean, they used to beat me up and, well, things that kids do. And so I felt very estranged from that community. And of course, after the war, uh, when we were essentially expelled from British Columbia, uh, it was looking in the mirror and seeing my eyes and seeing that that was the caricature of, of the enemy, I've always felt that, that uh, distance from, from the outside world. Now, my parents, we were impoverished at the end of the war, and Dad said the key to getting out of our, our situation is education. And the biggest threat when my parents were mad at me was I'll pull you out of school and send you to work. The idea of being pulled out of school was terrifying because education was the highest value in our family. And the other thing he said is, if, if you're going to compete with white people, you have to work 10 times harder. And fortunately, I've never been afraid of hard work. Whatever I've achieved is not, I believe, through any great talent, but just an abil a willingness to work hard. And, you know, I, my wife keeps saying, looking at my agenda and going, why are you going there? Why are you speaking to this group? Why are you, you know, and I'm going, I don't know, I just thought they were important and, and I've got to help them out. And I think underlying it is I still feel impelled to tell Canadians that they made a mistake in 1942 when they applied the War Measures Act, that in fact Japanese Canadians are, are strong, worthwhile individuals. When you're a young man, that's one thing. When you're 77, it's kind of a sickness, I think, and I haven't got over that that drive to keep proving to Canadians that I'm worth their respect. By now, if anybody has their respect, it's David Suzuki, well, I, would have, I would have thought. But, but it's a fascinating thing, isn't it, the way these, these things yeah. sort of shape you. Yeah. I remember reading some, some point that you had gone to Japan and you were on a subway and, and yeah. looked at the, the reflection in the window opposite yes. and you were startled that, this, that you couldn't tell yourself instantly. Well, you know how in a, in a subway, you, the, the window acts like a mirror. You can see yourself. And as I gazed out at this crowd of Japanese, I realized, wait a sec, where the hell am I? 
And I realized in that moment that my whole identity is being different in a white society. That suddenly when everybody looked like my parents and me, I couldn't really see myself. And so, you know, they, they say that Japanese are bananas like me. We're yellow on the outside and white on the inside. And the reality is that while walking down the street, you couldn't tell me from a crowd in Tokyo. The difference, the gulf between me and them is enormous, which is, you know, the cultural gulf because of my background. British, uh, British history is my history and Beethoven and Mozart are my, my music and it's a, you know, that's who I am. Uh, but you'd never know that just by looking at the outside. It's startling, isn't it? Yeah, and it's, no matter where you go, you are the outsider kind of, right? But, uh, and yet, in this, at, at this stage of the game, you, you're one of the Canadians that people, the Canadians are most proud of, which is... Well, what I love and value about Canada today is that there has been a deliberate attempt since Trudeau's time to create a multicultural society. In the, in the United States, the model is uh, a blended. It's like adding paints together and getting a mix. It's, uh, you blend everything into the American people, whereas we think of ourselves as a cultural mosaic in which we maintain our differences through our backgrounds, but that ultimately becomes a part of Canada. And to me, that's a very, very interesting model because I'm a geneticist and I spent 35 years studying an insect called a fruit fly. And I remember back in the early 1960s when geneticists began to apply molecular techniques to study the fruit fly. And they said, well, this is a very highly evolved animal. We expect the genes to be very homogeneous because they're highly selected. And to our amazement, exactly the opposite was found. When you look at specific genes, you find a great deal of diversity. It's called genetic polymorphism. And now we know the very definition of a strong species, strong in an evolutionary sense, is genetic diversity. That's why when species are reduced to a small number of animals, like Siberian tigers or whooping cranes, you're now left with a very small genetic base. And that threatens it because you don't have that inbuilt diversity. So then species diversity within an ecosystem, ecosystem diversity around the planet, and humans have added another level of diversity called culture. culture so diversity is the key to resilience of life and of human societies. It's cultural diversity that enabled us to carve out a place in the Arctic, in the Amazon, in island nations, in, in mountains. Like diversity, I think, is a genetic principle that confers resilience. When you get monoculture, a single idea, and this is what I think humanity is under a very great threat now, as we lose languages at a rate that is far greater than the loss of species, and we're losing species at a catastrophic rate, as languages disappear, a body of information in that culture that formed that language is lost forever. And right now we're being homogenized with a single idea of progress and development, and it's the wrong one. We need greater diversity. This is why I think the key to understanding our place in this country we call Canada has got to be the First Nations. The First Nations have a radically different sense of place. And you know, we all talk about roots. We got to establish roots in the country. And I agree we need roots. But my parents were the first generation of Japanese Canadians to be born in Canada. That group of Japanese Canadians, first, born, first Canadian born generation, like the firstborn generations of all immigrants to Canada, they had no grandparents. Their grandparents were in the old country. And so I believe that our roots are through our elders, especially our grandparents. And so with the loss of grandparents, we had to discover tiny roots in our place. But we have evolved into a very mobile society. We're, like in, in New York, uh, half the phone numbers change or the addresses change every year in the New York phone book. Why? Because people are moving all the time. And Canada is a microcosm of that. People are moving. So where do we have our roots in a place? To me, the real roots that tell us about place are the First Nations. And so we've got 
to really rediscover the, that sense of place through the guidance of First Nations people. It's amazing how frequently that theme comes up. The, 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 not so much the theme of diversity, but, but the, the whole sense that the First Nations uh, are really have to become our ancestors yes. too. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's so ironic because they, the way they've been hammered, we've had uh, 150, 200 years of an attempt to, to drive the Indian out of the Indian to make them into copies of us. And so we all know the horror stories of residential schools where children were beaten for speaking their language and, and, uh, prevented from, and cultures were prevented from practicing their traditional uh, uh, things like pot latches and, and pole raising and so on. We tried to get that stuff. They were out of their cultures. And now, 150 years later, some of us at least are realizing, oh my goodness, those our, our uh, senses of values, we have to rediscover. So we go back to the most disadvantaged group in our society, our First Nations, and beg their forgiveness so that we can learn from them. And uh, thank goodness it's happened. You know, I think 25 years ago, if we did a program on alcohol, we wouldn't hesitate to, to throw a picture up of a drunken Indian on Skid Row. We wouldn't do that in, at, at all today. The change has been quite amazing in the last uh, few decades. Well, the change in you, the change in me, the change in some, but culturally, okay, you know, politically, it seems to me that, that uh, it's like a flower is growing here and it's under a kind of glass bubble. It's not allowed to... I think our greatest problem now is that uh, what is driving our agenda now is a corporate agenda. And I think we've got to face that we act as if corporations are people. They're not. Corporations are simply the, the definition of a group of people b bound together uh, who are committed to one thing and one thing only. They may produce things that we need, things that we value, but the reality is the, the function, the role of a corporation is to make money. The, f the more, the faster, the better. And that is the and I've had many uh, arguments and discussions with CEOs of forest companies when we were involved with battles with the forest industry in British Columbia. And they tell me, look, your argument is not with me. Uh, my job is to make money for my shareholders and I'm good at it. If I didn't make money for my shareholders, I'd be booted out of there in a minute. So if you don't like what we're doing, your argument isn't with us. Your argument is with your government that allows us to do this. And uh, they're right. Our system is set up so that we try to manage our forests, but our management policies are to help the corporate sector, who are fighting constantly against regulation. Let us do it. Trust us. We've got track records now that go back decades. You know corporations in their drive for profit disregard anything else, and that's what their primary focus is. So trust us and don't regulate and don't tax us. And it's worked very well for the corporate agenda, but I think it's time for people to realize we corporations are not people, and yet we allow them to fund candidates for political office. Well, who the hell's got the most money to fund candidates? It's corporations. And once people are elected, who is the first person in the door? Your major funders, corporations. So we run on a corporate agenda, as you well know, in, in Nova Scotia. <laughs> Well, you know, and you know, it's in a way, it's kind of like a political monoculture, right? It's uh, you, the diversity exactly. you were talking about as being strength. Exactly. It's kind of swept away because of this singular drive for profit. And the problem is that we have had a situation where we get the argument, look, we can't do anything about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It'll destroy the economy. And in that simple statement that our prime minister has been repeating like a mantra for the last 15 or 20 years of his political life, we elevate the economy above the very atmosphere that keeps us alive. The economy is more important than the air we breathe. What kind of madness is that? 
We say we have to troll heavy weights across the bottom of the ocean, trashing the ocean bottom. We have to grow salmon in net, pay, net pens that use the oceans as a garbage can. We have to clear cut forests. We have to dump raw sewage into the oceans as we do in Victoria and, and Halifax. We have to pollute the air, water, and soil to be globally competitive. And so we elevate the economy above everything else. It's crazy. Why do we do this? Well, I think part of the problem is if you look at the evolutionary history of our species. We evolved in Africa 150,000 years ago. For 95% of human existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. We had to follow game and plants through the seasons wherever they were. When you're a nomad and you've got to carry everything you own on your back, you know very well that nature is the source of your survival and well-being. You understand where you belong. In the last 10,000 years of human existence, that signaled the agricultural revolution. In 1900, when there were 1.6 billion people in the world, there were only 14 cities with more than a million people. London was the largest with six and a half million people. Most people in Canada, United States, lived in rural village communities because 75, 80% of us were involved in some aspect of agriculture. We were farmers. And farmers understand very well that weather and climate are critical to, to our survival. They know in Canada the amount of snow in the winter directly related to the amount of moisture in the soil in the summer. They know you need insects to pollinate flowering plants, that certain species of plants will fix nitrogen as fertilizer in the soil. Farmers understand we are dependent on nature. But something happened in the last 100 years. We went from, from 1.6 billion in 1900, in the year 2000, now 6 billion people, four times as many people, but over 400 cities with a million people or more. So by the year 2000, the 10 largest cities all had more than 11 million people. In Canada, 80, 85% of us lived in big cities. So in a big city, your sense is, well, we create our own habitat. We create the city. And as long as we have a few parks to go and camp and play in, who needs nature? In a city, my highest priority is my job. I need a job to make the money to buy the things I want. And so in a city, the economy becomes very easily perceived as our highest priority. And when nature is no longer seen as something that is crucial to our well-being and survival, then I think you see a country that is as destructive as Canada has been and justifies everything in the name of economic progress. Robert Bateman, who we, we interviewed, um, feels very strongly about the importance of combating that by getting kids back out into the natural world. And you've done a huge amount of work with kids. Yeah. I'm a hum, you know, couple of dozen books, right, for kids. Um, how, what's the most important thing you can do with a child? Well, first of all, I think the dilemma for environmentalists today is that, the, you know, I, I keep saying it, I feel like we're in a giant car heading at a brick wall at 100 miles an hour, and everybody in the car is arguing about where they want to sit. Well, it doesn't matter who's driving. Someone's got to say, for God's sake, put the wheel, brakes on and turn the wheel. But people that are saying that are locked in the trunk. Nobody hears them. So we're heading straight at the brick wall, and there's a sense of urgency environmentalists now feel. And at the same time, we realize that it's the values and beliefs that we now cling to that is driving us in the first place. And so we've got, we can't afford another generation to grow up like us. And yet we don't have much time to turn the wheel and put on the brakes. So we have to do both things at once. But certainly in Canada, the average child today spends eight minutes a day outside and over six hours a day in front of a television screen, a computer, or a, a cell phone. So we've become radically isolated from the natural world. I have a friend in Toronto who lives in a high-rise apartment, completely air-conditioned. He says, in the morning I go down the elevator to the basement into my air-conditioned car, drives down the Don Valley Freeway into the basement of his air-conditioned commercial building, which is connected through tunnels to a whole series of shopping centers. He said, you know, Dave, I don't have to go outside for weeks. So we've created our habitat, and we don't even have the experience 
of the real world that supports us. How are we ever going to fight to protect nature if we don't love nature? So the challenge is that we have to reconnect that generation. And what I, I think to deal with the sense of urgency, I urge young people who we're involving in as many pa ways as we can to get outside and experience nature. And as they come to see what, what the world is like and what matters, I say the two people, most important people in the world have got to become warriors on your behalf. You can't vote. And yet decisions being made today are going to reverberate through your entire lives. And your mom and dad have to become eco-warriors on your behalf. And so that's where I think we can try to deal with the two, the two problems. One is the urgency, and yet the need to get kids in a, thinking a different way, is to combine the children's awareness with the need for political action through their parents. I sometimes wonder, when you talk to, to the CEOs, as you've mentioned, they've got kids. They've got kids. How come, it, how come they keep on keeping on within the context of that corporate agenda? That's a good right. question. I think it's a classic dilemma that allows people who are cutthroat uh, entrepreneurs or uh, stock investors for the work days of the week. And then they go to church and piously pledge to help their neighbors and be generous and all. And then Monday, they're right back. We can live with the, this kind of uh, s fragmentation or separation of the two hemispheres because we act as if what we do at work is not relevant to our, f of course, you know, I've talked to a lot of conservatives who say, well, I love going camping, I love my kids going out there, of course. But then they get back into a world where the rules are very, very different. They work in a world in which the rules are not bound by any kind of constraints imposed by the biosphere or the world around. So, you know, I've spent I hate to think how many years now, fighting. And we've had, in many of the battles I've been involved in, we've had tremendous victories. We stopped, we've kept the Alaskans from drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge where the porcupine caribou herd uh, uh, has their calves. And I've done three shows on caribou uh, in that area and we've stopped the drilling impulse and then Sarah Palin gets elected and, you know, drill baby drill. We stopped at, uh, David Anderson was the leader of the Liberal Party's party in, in BC. He stopped the proposal to bring super tankers from the North Slope in Alaska down British Columbia's coast to Seattle, to the refineries. He stopped that. We stopped a dam on the, at Site C on the Peace River. We stopped uh, the proposal to drill for oil in Hecate Strait. And I got very involved in a proposal to build a dam in uh, Brazil at a place called Altamira. Well, 35 years later, guess what? We're fighting every one of those same battles over again. So what we thought were victories were really pyrrhic. We didn't win. It was a skirmish. And we failed in the most fundamental way. The challenge is to see ourselves in a different relationship with nature. So we fought. We fought against this dam. But we didn't educate people about why we were fighting against it. It was that we see this, the role of this river as really important. It's not that we want it, it's a power struggle between us and the electricity generators. I mean, that's not what the battle is. The battle is how do we see ourselves living on this planet? And f environmentalists have fundamentally failed that battle because we're fighting them over and over again. So the real challenge is to look at our relationship with the earth. That's why I think any initiative to try to get people thinking about the right to a healthy environment. When you start thinking, what is a healthy environment? You come up right away. Well, of course, our most fundamental needs to stay alive are clean air, clean water, clean soil that gives us our food, photosynthesis that gives us all of the energy in our bodies, and biodiversity. Those are the critical elements that keep us healthy and alive. So if you're talking about a healthy environment, you've got to talk about the protection of the air and the water. That's absolutely critical. So I think um, this kind of an initiative will begin to give people the opportunity of reassessing their place on the planet and what the, the fundamental needs are. I'm, you know, I've had a belly full of fighting and people may feel, 
an ind indication of our power when we win, win these battles. But I'm very frustrated because, you know, when we were fighting uh, forest issues in British Columbia in the si 60s and 70s, the BC government attempted to get rid of the argument by setting up round tables. So in a round table you have all of the stakeholders. I hate that word because we're all involved in what's going on. But you have the forest industry and you have the loggers and you have the, the, the tourism operators, you have the native community and all of the stakeholders with a stake in the forest come together and then they duke it out. And in the end what you get is a compromise or you have a winner and a loser. And I just don't think when it comes to the future state of the, the planet, we can't compromise the things that matter and we can't afford to have losers anymore. So I think the only way that we're going to win these issues in the long run is to come together in a room and say, look, let's leave our vested interests outside. Let's come together as human beings and ask the question, what do we all agree on? What are the most important things that we all agree we have to protect at all costs? And then I say the most important lesson is that we are animals. We're not human beings or engineers. Or, we're animals. And as animals, if you don't have air for more than three or four minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air all your life, you're sick. So surely to goodness, our highest priority above anything else is to protect the air that we depend on. And then you go down that as animals we need water, we need food that comes from the soil, and we need energy that comes from the sun. Those, without those things, we don't survive. So I suggest that our biological nature sets the non-negotiable fundamental needs. They must, in fact, be considered sacred. They're not negotiable because they're sacred. They keep all life on earth alive and healthy. And then you say, well, but we're also social creatures. And as social creatures, what is our biggest, most pri highest priority? Well, to my amazement, when I began to read, science, it was love. That during a, an infant's uh, growth, there are windows during which there has to be maximum of love. That infant has to know that it is loved in order to be capable of empathy and being welcomed to the family of human beings, to learn how to love back, to care for others, to be a fully developed human being. We need love at critical times during, during our uh, childhood. And what is it that, that we have to do to ensure a maximum of love? We have to have full employment, we have to have uh, social justice, gender equity, these are all factors that contribute to our ability to give fully of love and we need to have freedom from, from hunger and poverty. We need to be free of genocide, terror and war. Those to me are my issues because without those things we cannot develop our full human potential. And then we, when we assure ourselves of, of those fundamental needs, we are spiritual creatures. So it's like a Maslovian uh, set of conditions. You know, you satisfy your biological needs and then another set of needs, our social needs, emerge. Satisfy those, then the most important is our spiritual needs. And I'm not talking about a religious sense, but I believe that we fundamentally need to know our place in the biosphere, that there are things impinging on our lives that we'll never understand or control, that there are sacred places that we go with veneration, that uh, uh, that we were born out of nature and when we die we return to nature. I think to me those are fundamental uh, needs or cravings that have to be satisfied. Then we ask, okay, everybody in the room, we agree. Those are our highest values and needs. Then we say, how do we make a living? How do we live together as communities? But we're asking it all the wrong way. We elevate the economy and our communities and all of these other things up at the very top. And then we, we try to shoehorn nature to serve our priorities. It won't work. It strikes me that it's, you, know, you were raised in a reductionist scientific tradition. Yes. And Dr. Suzuki, this would not be the kind of thing that would have gone down well <laughs> in, a, in a PhD oral in your youth, would it? No, I remember once when I was a young assistant professor 
and I said, well, I don't think, you know, if you learn all of the components of a nucleus and of the cell, you, and, and we will still not understand what life is. And right away, this kid jumped up and said, you're a vitalist. You believe there's some magic spirit. It gives life. It's different. It's just a matter of chemicals and molecules joined together, and that's life. And all I was saying is, I think the whole cannot be predicted by, from the sum of its parts. Because, but that was heretical back in the 60s. The idea that dominated, especially my area of genetics, was called reductionism, where you focus on a part of nature, a subatomic particle, an atom, a molecule, a cell, a, a tissue, a, an animal, a population. At different levels, you focus on a part, and you try to isolate it from everything else and measure that part. And of course, it's been a very powerful approach. We've liberated the energy from atoms, and we've done amazing things. But what we find is, let's say I, as a physicist, come to you and say, well, I understand all the physical properties of atomic hydrogen, and I, these are the atomic properties of oxygen. And I say then to that person, well, Mr. Physicist, what happens if you take, knowing that, what happens when you take two atoms of hydrogen combine them together with one atom of oxygen and make a molecule of water. What are, what, is the, what are the properties of water? And the physicist has to say, I don't have a clue. When you combine those two elements, there are what we now call emergent properties. Properties that emerge out of the combination that cannot be predicted by the, sum of, by the individual parts. That still large parts of science ha have not accepted or understood. And biology, biology should be the area that, is, that sees the bigger picture. But we've become very, very reductionist. And for me, the big change was in 1962, right at the beginning of my career in genetics. I was an assistant professor in, at the University of Alberta. And Rachel Carson published a book called Silent Spring. And it was, you know, you have to remember, this is all about the unexpected effects of DDT. We thought, we, the scientific community, thought DDT was fantastic. Paul Mueller discovered DDT kills insects. He was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1948. What Rachel Carson did was say, yes, at least as I read the book, it said to me, yes, you scientists are clever. You can make a molecule like DDT, and it kills insects. But the lab is not the real world. In the real world, it rains. Day follows night follows day. Wind blows. All kinds of things happen. You have no idea. So you spray DDT on an open field to kill insects. Guess what? You end up affecting fish and birds and human beings. And for me as a geneticist, that was mind-boggling. I had thought I study a part of nature in the lab. And if enough people are studying enough parts of nature, then like a giant jigsaw puzzle, we put them all back together and we can recreate the world. That's reductionism. And Rachel Carson said to me, it doesn't work that way in the real world. And at that very time, I started a career, I didn't know it was a career then, in broadcasting and television. I did my first television series of eight programs in 1962. <laughs> and uh, black and white, of course. And uh, um, my, war my warning, my message to geneticists was, Look, we're, we can see what's going on at the level of genes and chromosomes, but when you begin to try to apply those principles to human beings and whole organisms, we really don't know what we're doing. That was considered heretical. I think it still is considered heretical by the vast bulk of geneticists. But the warning that Rachel Carson gave us about nature, I believe, is every bit as relevant to geneticists as well, about human nature. But. Uh, that began my career, and so I, I see myself as a systems analyst or someone trying to look at constantly at the context or the bigger picture. When you said it's like a jigsaw puzzle and we put it all together, nobody ever actually does that, right? Well, we, we keep on doing smaller and smaller and smaller. That's parts, true. Right? That's very true. But even at the organismic level, we see little insights, and you know, for the classic example is. We've got a case now where human activity has reduced the habitat of a woodland caribou down to where you've got this tiny population of woodland caribou existing in Alberta 
down to a few dozen animals. And we go, well, woodland caribou numbers are down. Wolves eat woodland caribou. Therefore, we shoot wolves. Woodland caribou should go. Give me a break. You know, all we do is we use this simple predator-prey model. And we think, shoot the predator, the prey should come up. But, and that allows us to, uh, to avoid looking in the mirror at the biggest predator of all because we want that space for ourselves. And so we use these simple, simple-minded models, predator, prey, kill the prey, predator. And, and that's again to me an, an idea of reductionism uh, at its worst. Now it seems to me that when David Suzuki has been looking at this over the years, Ultimately, he comes to the to the First Nations perspective because that's the big picture, right? That's uh, and and that's been there for a long, long time, yes. and we haven't been paying attention. But your sense of, of of the of the unity of your thinking and, and the First Nations thinking is very powerful. In they have work. My, the First Nations have been my teacher now for forty years. I uh, the first time I really encountered and understood the reality there was a radically different way of thinking was in the early 1970s. And we decided to do a show on the battle over logging in the Queen, at that time called the Queen Charlotte Islands. And one of the leaders in the fight against logging was a young artist named Gujo. He's now the president of the Haida Nation, but he was just this young guy. And I said to him, look, you've got over 50% unemployment in your community. Some of the loggers are Haida, so it's giving them jobs. The non-Haida loggers come into your community and they, they go to your restaurants and your stores. I mean, it's adding economic value to your community. Why would you want to stop the logging? And he said, well, yeah, I guess if, if the trees are all gone, we'll still be here. But then we'll be like everybody else, I guess. And at the time he said that, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. It was only when we got back to Vancouver and I started looking at the films and thinking, what, what does he mean? And I realized then he's saying, as Haida, we don't just end at our, end at our skin or fingertips. To be a Haida means to be connected to the land, that those trees are a part of who the Haida are, that the rivers and the air and the, the birds and the fish, all of that is what makes the Haida bound to that place. Their history, their culture is dictated to them by that connection with the land. And I realized then that environmentalists, as environmentalists, we'd, we'd, we'd describe the problem the wrong way. We thought of it as the environment's out there, we're here, and we've got to manage our interaction or relationship with it, with laws and regulations. But what the Haida were saying is, no, we, there is a connection so profound that there is no difference between the, env the environment is who we are. Sever that and we are just, we're no longer bound to a place. So it's that rootedness in place that really defines us. And when you think about it, you've now visited Vancouver for a few days, you've drunk the water, you've eaten the food, you've, you've breathed the air, there's as much a part of Vancouver now is a part of your body and you take that away with you. But our roots, our consciousness, awareness of who we are and where we belong, I believe as a nation of, of immigrants, has been radically reduced. After all, cultures evolve over long periods of time, and that cultural knowledge is passed from generation to generation through our elders. And when you come from abroad to this country, you've got the indigenous people, who you, uh, you control and colonize and attempt to de-indigenize them by eliminating their culture. The new immigrants have children who are the first Canadian born in this land, but those children all have no connection to their past culture because they have no grandparents. My, my uh, mom and dad were born in Vancouver in 1910, and, well, 1909 and 1911, and they grew up in Japantown, in Vancouver, and all the kids their age had no grandparents because the grandparents were in Japan. So the, old, the connection with Japan was maintained by their parents, but the connection to the land here, they had to make up as they went. They're the first ones that learned English or French and, and began to learn where they were. So he, we've, uh, we are really a rootless society whose only 
opportunity for understanding our deeper roots come from the indigenous people. And we have so marginalized them that I believe the, the important thing is go back to them now and say thank you for hanging on and keep hanging on and then please, although we don't deserve it, give us a chance to learn from you. You now have a descendant who's part First Nation. I do. Right. I have two Haida grandchildren who live on reserve. And it's amazing, like this week, uh, the, uh, the pink salmon are running up every little creek uh, in, on reserve. And my grandson, one of my grandsons is four years old now. He, he's been bugging mom and dad to go down and catch one. And finally, they gave him a, a well, it's a, a salmon net. Uh, a, well, it took, when you catch a salmon to get the net. They said, okay, you, you hold it here. And then mom and dad went downstream and chased the pink, and he caught, my grandson caught his first pink salmon. They're called humpies because they get a big hump on the back. Let's eat it, mom. Let's eat it. He wanted to eat it right away. And he said, and let's catch some more and we can bottle them. He is learning what it is to be a Haida living on that land. It's an amazing Thing. And I love going up because he's now teaching me. You have a you have a terrific um, capacity to come up with, with illustrations and and uh, that show something much very large in a very comprehensible way. And for me, one of those is your is your story about Harlow Shapley and the Argonne Gas, which really echoes the First Nation apprehension of the way we live in the world. Exactly, exactly. So Harlow Shapley was an astronomer in the United States, and years ago he asked the question, "What happens to one breath of air?" Well, how do you measure a breath of air? It's 98% uh, of the air is made up of oxygen and nitrogen. You breathe it in, oxygen goes in, and nitrogen go into our bodies. Much of the, well, not much, maybe 10% of the oxygen stays in our bodies. 80% uh, of the air is nitrogen, and some of it stays and doesn't come back out. But 1% of the air is an element called argon. Argon belongs to a class of elements called the noble gases. I had thought originally that Dr. Noble must have discovered them, but no, these elements are so snooty, they think they're above everything else. They don't go in for that cheap physical stuff. They are chemically inert. They don't respond uh, chemically to any other uh, elements. So you breathe it into your body, argon goes into our bodies. You breathe it out, it comes right back out. So argon's a very good marker or indicator for a breath of air. How many atoms of argon in one breath of air Shapley calculates 1 times 10 to the super 18. That's 1 followed by 18 zeros. So take it from me. That's a lot of argon. So you t say that, Don, you breathe out, and then there are all gazillions of argon atoms that are going up my nose and everybody else's nose. But of course, it very quickly diffuses through this room, doors open, windows open, out across Vancouver, across the Pacific, around the world. And according to Shapley, one year later, Every breath you take will have about 15 argon atoms from the one original breath taken a year before. So on that basis, Shapley calculates every breath we take has millions of argon atoms that were once in the bodies of Joan of Arc and Jesus Christ. That every breath we take has millions of argon atoms that came from dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That every breath we take will suffuse life forms as far as we can see into the future. So a breath through the argon, we understand that our, the air that we breathe connects us in a very, very profound way. And now others have calculated what about the carbon, the, the carbon dioxide that comes out of our breath. Every breath will ultimately suffuse every single needle and leaf on every tree on the planet. I mean, the connectedness is so very profound. What intelligent creature, knowing that profound connectedness, between us and the rest of life, would then use, proceed to use that, that substance as a garbage can, dumping toxic chemicals into the air and acting as if somehow it, it will just diffuse and dilute away and not affect us. We are air. We are created by the air. We are air. It's in us. It's circulating through our bodies. And that kind of understanding, I believe, should lead to a veneration. We should, it's sacred. And we should be a species that goes, wait a minute now, don't dump that into the air for God's sakes. That's the air. You don't treat air that way. And I see young couples trying to be 
environmentally responsible and not taking the car and pushing babies in a stroller. Where is that baby's nose? It's right at the level of the exhaust pipes of every car going by on the street. I wanted to, nobody liked the idea, but I wanted to take a car with the exhaust hooked up with a pipe going right into the mask on an infant just to show that you're pumping that stuff straight into the body of an infant that is growing so rapidly that you're affecting that infant much more than an adult. But this is, if we don't see the connectedness with everything, then we will act as if, yeah, you can dump the stuff I into the air and it'll just go away. And look at where we are now. The, because the economy is at our highest level of priority, we don't, we corporations do not want to pay to put something into the air. We pay to put stuff into landfill, but we do not want a price on carbon. We don't want to pay to use the atmosphere. And yet, it's what gives us life. It's crazy. Is that connectedness through the air, and, and not only the air, many other mm. vectors as well, is that the most important thing for people to understand about who they are and where they are, if you're going to attack all these issues we've been describing? It says it's the most fundamental understanding we need just to stay alive. So I would have thought that would be our something that should be ingrained in our society. And as I say, I believe for 99% of human existence, we knew that very, very well. We knew we were dependent on nature for our well-being and survival, and we treated nature in a very different way from what we do now. But now we've been so disconnected, we have to go back and try to reinculcate that notion of connectedness. We tend to fragment the world, and, and I'm afraid science does this as much as any activity, Fo in focusing we lose sight of the bigger picture. And constantly I see this in the media. You can, you know, I live and die by the six, six o'clock news on CBC radio. But if you think about the six, half an hour of news on CBC radio, you may get 15 to 20 items. And they may be a flood in Bangladesh, a drought in Somalia, forest fires in Colorado. But you never hear anyone say, now these separate distant events may all be related in some way because they all reflect our change in climate. They're all reported as if they're in separate, uh, separate categories altogether. And when a reporter comes on and says, and tonight we bring you an in-depth report, he's talking about a two-minute report. So we fragment the world into smaller and smaller snippets so that a two-minute report is a big report. So we are losing sight of the big picture. Uh, all over the place. It's that, and that's an astonishing fact. I mean, in a sense, we're flooded with information and we are bereft exactly. of knowledge and understanding. Exactly. You know? Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I began my career in television because I believed that the way to make the most informed decisions is through information. And that the best information about the world around comes from science. And I believe that, this is in 1962, I felt that most of science was being applied outside the knowledge of the general public, and so it was being applied for political or corporate interests. And it was too much of science was too important to leave just to politicians and business people. And so I wanted to educate people by providing them with the best information through science. The David Suzuki Foundation was started in 1990 as a science-based organization. We wanted to use the best science to describe the state of the world so that we could make the best informed decisions. Well, I mean, through the, the media now, people have access to information that is mind-boggling in, you know, like you can access everything in the, in the Library of Congress in the United States, virtually every book on the planet you have access to. It's, it's astonishing. And yet the vast bulk of what people are consuming on the internet is pornography, or it's about buying and selling stuff. It's not about really meaningful information. So in this kind of world of, of information overload, one of the most important things we have to do is to determine what is credible information. So I'm told over and over by people that come up and say, you're full of shit about climate change. I just found a website that says we're going into global cooling. We should be burning more fossil fuels. And I say, wait a minute now. 
where did you get that information? Well, I found a website. I said, yeah, but who was funding the website? Guess what? There are dozens of websites out there funded by the fossil fuel industry to say that climate change is junk science. You've got to be more credible than that. This is what leads me to be very discouraged about what's happening in Canada and happened in the United States under George Bush. And that was the suppression of science. Any science group that's talking about the possible effects of, uh, of our burning of fossil fuels and climate were definitely muzzled or inhibited by active policies of governments in Canada and the United States. If we can't have credible science and scientists speaking out, who are we going to trust? Are we going to trust the, 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 the CEO of Exxon or of BP or, or of uh, Enbridge? That seems to be, we're giving lots of time to Enbridge and, and uh, Shell to tell us why this is all important and good and how responsible they're being. But what about some serious scientists? I'm stunned by the, the fact that we have the greatest information medium that human beings ever had in the form of particular of television and that so little of it is devoted to anything other than the most bottom level entertainment, you know, with, with honorable exceptions. Yeah, well, but not many uh, of them, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, unfortunately even our, the public corporation, the CBC, is ultimately driven by the competition for viewers. The Nature of Things began as a half hour program in 1960. I became the host when it was transformed into a one hour program in 1979. But I know that it's not because science programming is important, it's because the nature of things year after year has delivered an audience big enough to justify keeping it on air. But in the competition for audience, and especially in a time of, you know, when I started, there were basically two channels. It was CBC and CTV. Now anyone with cable or a satellite uh, dish can get anywhere from 90 to over a thousand channels. And so we're all competing for that viewer who's clicking through the, the programs or channels as quickly as possible. And when they click onto the nature of things, how do you say, don't you dare touch that dial, you stay on this program. How do you do it? Well, you shout, you're louder, you're sexier, you're more violent. I mean, it's not an accident that our biggest audience uh, over the last 10 years was a show called Fallacies, spelled P-H-A-L-L, -L, on the penis. Yeah. I mean, we're caught up in the same thing. We're doing shows on psychopaths, on uh, uh, female castration. We're doing shows that uh, are competing in a very loud, uh, sensational uh, community of, of programs. And so we become more and more superficial. In uh, 1972, when The Nature of Things was a half-hour program, uh, we did a, we, I wasn't a part of it then, but The Nature of Things did a show on the first uh, Earth Summit in, re, in uh, Stockholm. And in that half-hour show, they had an interview with Paul Ehrlich and Lady Barbara, Barbara, whatever, an English leader. Uh, they were three and four minute interviews in a half hour show. Today with an hour program, we would never do a straight headshot for longer than 20 seconds. So everything is sped up. And that's, I think, it means that you're more and more superficial. We don't have time. And the frightening thing to me is I watched the 1972 show, because we were thinking of doing one in, in uh, 1992. And I, I kept looking at the interviews going, oh my God, this is slow. This, you know, my expectations have sped up as well. But when everything is sped up and fragmented into smaller pieces, you don't have time for profundity or a time to just reflect. You know, I remember I was on a show with a guy named Bob McLean who had a talk show and he said, Dave, what's the world going to be like in the year 2000? This is back in the 1970s. And, you know, I said, Bob, I think if we survive to the end of this century, they'll blame us for two things. They'll blame us for nuclear power and television. And he kind of did a double take. And he, rather than pursuing the television, he pursued nuclear power. But I wanted to, him to say, why television? I said, you know, I would have said, Bob, you've just asked a very serious question. What will television be like in 30 years? And I would think, I need a, a moment to think about that. 
So I said, if I didn't say another word for 10 seconds while I was thinking about the answer, you would cut to a commercial in three seconds because television cannot tolerate dead space. And so television has no room for profundity or serious thought. Does this relate to the Council of Elders that you, you started through the Jay Suzuki Foundation? Well, uh, Jim Fulton, who was our first executive director, who was a um, politician from uh, Skeena riding, which is up north, two, a third of his riding were First Nations. And Jim and, and Tara, my wife and I, had been very strongly affected by our connection with Aboriginal people. And one of the things you notice when you go into a village, even in the most dysfunctional community, you know, with problems of suicide and alcohol and diabetes and obesity, the elders are like rock stars. You go to a feast or a celebration, when an elder comes in, the young kids run up, uncle or grandma, they take their arm and take them to the front row seats when they are always the ones to get up and open in the event with a prayer. They're always the ones that the food is, the first serving is to the elders, and the elders close the meeting with a, with a prayer. Elders are the absolute important group in society. And so when we started the David Suzuki Foundation, we said, we need elders there. And I thought what the elders would be would be people just dropping in and sitting and our staff would come by and go, oh, Mary, hi, how are you? Let's have a coffee and sit down and chit chat. That's what they do in a, in a native community. But we were too busy saving the world. You know, oh, we got a job. Hi, Mary, you know, off we go. And so the poor elders who met here month after month for years have struggled to find their own identity. They wanted the foundation to say, hey, why don't you do this? But the foundation said, no, we want you to find a role. And now they've got their, their legs and they're really, uh, I think, going. But not in the way that Jim and I originally thought. They're going now as a group of people who I think, you see, elders have a very special role in society. They're the only group that has lived an entire lifetime. So as a group, they're now freed. You know, when I was a young man, I was ambitious and they're freed from the drive for fame or money or power. They've, they're above that now and they can look back on a life, a life that has celebrated successes, has suffered failures, made mistakes. Damn it all, we've learned a lot through the, the mistakes that we've made in our lives. Haven't we learned something worth passing on to young people? So I tell older elders now, get the hell off the couch, get off the golf course, get on with the most important part of your life. And that is sifting through your life for those nuggets of life experiences, heavily paid to, to learn those experiences, and those what you ought to be passing on to, your, on to young people. That's your job, that's your, your duty, your responsibility. And so as we drive towards a discussion about the right to a healthy environment, I really hope that First Nations and elders are going to be a large part of that driving, that driving force. That is a huge learning, isn't it? To yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I've kind of nicknamed the elders' involvement uh, silverbacks and grizzlies. You know, the silverback gorilla male and grizzly moms famous for fighting for their cubs. I want men and women who have track records of a lifetime of showing they cared about Canada, about their communities. I want them to be a huge part of this discussion because They've learned a lot through the years. You know, I think back, my mother and father were young adults. They went through the Great Depression, which was one of those very, very difficult learning experiences. Well, you well know that they paid a, a, a well, it was a tough time during the Great Depression. And because of that, my parents drilled into my head, live within your means, save some for tomorrow, share, don't be greedy, help your neighbors, you may one day need their help. These kind of things just were constantly told to us. You know, you, you have to work hard to make money to buy the necessities, the necessities in life. But you don't run after money as if having more money made you a more important or, or, or better person. You know, you, gotta, you need the money for the necessities in life. These are things, the values, that they had learned through the learning experience of living through the Great Depression. 
And I think that people, having lived an entire lifetime, have many lessons like that that are worth passing on to our kids. I hope you'll find a way to extend that right across the country. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Elders have got to be critical. I just saw a wonderful film made by a filmmaker uh, in New Brunswick in which he interviewed elders uh, throughout the five provinces around the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And they were mostly fishers, fisher people, but just talking about the changes that they can see in the ocean as a result of climate change. So here are people that don't understand anything about what climate change is about, but they'll just tell you, yeah, the breakwater there, we're going to have to replace it because uh, the water is rising and, uh, you know, we've got to, that breakwater doesn't work anymore. It's going to cost us millions of dollars. And, and just the descriptions of their place and the changes in their lifetime, really important to us to understand it's happening. And one of the things that Daniel Pauly, a fisheries biologist at UBC, has told us is that we constantly face the problem of shifting baselines so that one generation, if they don't learn from their elders, forgets what it was during the life of their elders. And so they think what they've experienced is normal. There was a wonderful uh, film on PBS years ago called Empty Oceans, Empty Nets. And uh, there was a sequence where they had a young swordfish uh, skipper, a woman uh, skippering on a swordfish boat uh, out of Boston. And she said, oh yeah, there are a lot of swordfish out there. We, we put out and we go up around the coast of Newfoundland and we get our limit on and Newfoundland. And they're big ones too. She said, I, I heard someone caught a 90 pounder a few days ago. So to her, going up to Newfoundland and a 90 pounder, this is the new normal. And then they cut to a, a, a retired swordfish fisherman. And he said, oh yeah, we never went much further than six or ten miles away from Boston. And if we got anything under 200 pounds, we threw it back. So, you see, his baseline is radically different from this young skipper. And if we forget the baseline, then we're just constantly shifting it and forgetting. This is why Har Farley Mowat's book, Sea of Slaughter, is so important. When you read Farley's book, you just want to weep because at a time, and this is to my Newfoundland sealers uh, attention, in a time when there were seals in abundance beyond anything we know, the oceans were filled with northern cod and all the walruses that went all the way down to North Carolina. I mean, it was a radically different world in the world when, when Farley describes it, but that's nothing like what we know today. One last question that comes out also out of the First Nations and also relates to food is you've quoted an Inuit hunter who says that the greatest peril of life lies in the fact that human food consists entirely of souls. Ah. What does he mean? Well, I mean that if life is who we are, every bit of our food was once alive. And I think if you regard life as somehow this gift from the Creator, however you want to regard the Creator, that life is endowed with something that you might call essence, we used to call it vital force, something about life, one might consider that to be spirit. That feeling, whether that's a, a human created sense or whether it really is, is reality, it, it doesn't matter if you have a sense that life is something miraculous and endowed with something special, it seems to me that you treat it in a fundamentally different way. And it's not just the life that you go out and capture and kill and consume. That, of course, is very, very important. But it's just the rest of life on Earth. It's that the breath of the plants in the oceans and on land are what give me breath. And I like to illustrate uh, what this means by saying, if we were to imagine that scientists create time travel. And this room is a giant time machine. So I punch the buttons and I transport us back four billion years before there was any life on Earth. So we go back to a sterile planet. And of course, well, we'd say, gee, what was the world like before there was any life? You open the hatch and out you run, and every one of us is dead as a doornail in three or four minutes. Why? Because before life, the air was filled with carbon dioxide, with nitrogen and sulfur compounds and water, but there was no oxygen. Oxygen was a creation of life. Oxygen is a very highly reactive element. And so if oxygen is free, it immediately 
oxidizes or rusts whatever's out there and disappears. It was only when plants or, or uh, bacteria found a way to capture the sun's energy as a, and gave a byproduct called oxygen that over millions of years the concentration of oxygen went up to 19 or 20 percent. So before there was life there was no air for us to breathe. Before there was any life, there was, you'd see lots of water, but where would you think that water is safe to drink? We get our water in Vancouver from three watersheds surrounded by old growth rainforest. That plant roots and soil fungi and bacteria filter the water. We don't have to do anything to it, we just drink it. Without life, you don't have trustable, potable water because life is a critical part of the hydrologic cycle. Before there was life, there was nothing to eat because every bit of our food was once alive. And even if you went back and tried to grow some seeds, there was no soil. Soil is created by life. And finally, if you wanted to say that we're back four billion years and night falls and you get homesick and want to start a fire, there was nothing to burn. When you think gas, coal, oil, wood, peat, dung, all of that is created by life. There was no fuel. And even if we brought our own fuel and paper and, and you stroke, struck a match, there was no fire because to have fire you needed oxygen. So the point is that our most fundamental needs, air, water, soil, fire, are created by life. And without that, we don't exist as an animal. And so those surely should be the highest things in our lives that are absolutely crucial to our survival and well-being. And if we want to say life is imbued with spirit that allows us to live, that's not a bad way to look at it. I'm, I'm willing to concede that. In fact, I'd say it's pretty fundamental. Give thanks. You know, th just a story. Uh, I was on a panel with a, a Vietnamese monk named Thich Nhat Hanh, and it was a great privilege for me, and uh, he arrived at this place in, at UBC, and I was all anxious to, to talk to him before we went, did this interview, and uh, he said, let's not talk. He was surrounded by a bunch of disciples. He said, let's take a walk. And I thought, I, I want to talk to him, like, you know, what, what, don't. So he said, and let's not talk. And so we just walked, and it was, turned out to be a lovely area with lots of uh, flowers and plants. So I was annoyed at first, but as I began to walk, and look around, I thought, God, isn't that amazing? You know, that plant is taking carbon out of the atmosphere and giving oxygen back in it. So what's coming out of those leaves is going directly into my lungs. And so I really am physically connected to that, all of the green things in this area. And I began to see the whole area I was walking in as just one big entity. I was connected in the most profound way to everything around. And we walked for half an hour, and at the end of it, he said, "Now, now, wasn't that nice?" You know, and I, and he said, "Did you have? Did you enjoy yourself?" I said, "Yes." You know, that was very satisfying. He said, "Why do we have to buy all this stuff to entertain ourselves?" He said, "That was so satisfying," and I think uh, that sense, the recognition of our connectedness, is a wonderful, a wonderful thing, and to 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 gain that. We need time. We're so bloody, we're in such a bloody hurry now. We're so busy. You know, it's, uh, we don't have time for these most fundamental lessons. And why? Again, that reminds me of a story that the most important elder in my life was my father. And when, in 1994, when he was 85, he was dying of a form of cancer, thank goodness, that wasn't painful. And I moved in to care for him the last month of his life. And that was one of the happiest times I've spent with my father. We just talked and laughed and cried. And every night my wife and kids had come with slides of pictures of, of trips we'd taken with my dad. And he kept saying over and over, David, I die a rich man. Now he, in terms of money, he, Tar and I were subsidizing him all the time. He wasn't a wealthy man, but he kept saying that. And I realized that in all the time that we were together, 
He never once said, gee, do you remember that 1985 Dodge I had? Or do you remember that closet full of fancy clothes or the house I owned in London? All we talked about were family, friends, and neighbors, and things that we did together. And for my father, that was his wealth. And he died a rich man. And we've got off on this really weird idea that stuff, stuff that in many ways separates us, isolates us from the community to which we belong, that that's what makes us happy. It's not at all. And that's at the end of our lives. I absolutely guarantee that none of that stuff is what you're going to say. That's what my life is all about. That's my great legacy is I built a big house on our lot. I mean, it's, that's not what, what life, I think, is about. The legendary David Suzuki, the most revered environmental leader in Canada, reflecting on the tragedy of what we've done and the urgency of what we need to do now. Not long ago, we did a green interview with another brilliant Suzuki, David's daughter, Sarika Kala Suzuki. You might want to look at that one, too. For the green interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. I look forward to meeting you here again.